Hi, welcome. Uh, I'm Christina DeRocher. I'm the director of the Museum of Art at the University of New Hampshire, and I am delighted to be welcoming you today for Michael Menchaca's talk. I'll be introducing Michael and Sarah Withers, who um, is a professor of anthropology at the University of New Hampshire. And I just want to remind people to please use the Q&A to ask questions for Michael after his presentation. Michael Menchaca is an interdisciplinary Chicanx artist active in disrupting racist narratives that target Latinx, Black, and Indigenous peoples of color using print media and new media formats to generate anti-colonial, anti-racist, and anti-capitalist visions of the world. Menchaca has developed a personalized lexicon of animal archetypes and narrative pattern designs to assist in mythologizing the interwoven histories of European colonization US slavery and mass incarceration, and the increasing develop deployment of surveillance technologies that maximize settler colonial capacities of racial and social control. Their design for the PC exterior elevator tower mural, Hope is a Discipline, which is located here on campus, is titled after a quote by activist, educator, and organizer Maria May Kaba, who is an advocate for racial, gender, and transformative justice. Kaba's quote is paired with this combination of imagery to instill in viewers a sense of faith in hoping for a more just future for BIPOC communities. Menchaca received their associate degree from San Antonio College in 2007, their BFA from Texas State University in 2000 and 11, and their MFA from the Rhode Island School of Design in 2015. They are currently included in the exhibition MX21 Resistance, Reaffirmation, and Resilience at Mexic Arte, Austin, Texas, and that show is up through February 22nd. February, I'm sorry, February 2022. Sarah Withers is a senior lecturer in anthropology who received a PhD in cultural anthropology from Brandeis University in 2009. Withers research was in Oaxaca, Mexico, focused on a growing urban middle class, more specifically in the intersection of gendered ideals and ideas about work, specifically in the ways in which female teachers negotiated both their personal identities as professional women with idealized notions of motherhood. Since concluding her research in Mexico, she has shifted her interests more locally, particularly to the lives and experiences of refugees in New Hampshire. Withers was project manager for the film Uprooted, Heartache and Hope in New Hampshire in 2010, produced by the Center of Humanities at UNH, and since then has been the Humanities to Go presenter for the New Hampshire Humanities Council, acting as a discussant and facilitator for the film. Her next research project is a follow-up to Uprooted as she continues to share the stories of New Hampshire refugees. She teaches a number of interdisciplinary classes at UNH, including Introduction to Cultural Anthropology, Anthropology of Gender and Sexuality, Peoples and Cultures of Latin America, Medical Anthropology, and Applied Anthropology. And we're excited to have many of her students joining us for today's conversation. 
So thank you both for joining us. Uh, we're delighted to uh, welcome you all today. Just a reminder to please use the Q&A to post questions. I'll be monitoring that and I'll be sure to submit your questions to Michael. And just, just so you know, this recording will also be available on the museum's YouTube channel once it's concluded. So Michael, it's such a pleasure to have you. Thank you for joining us and I'll let you take it away. Looks like I'm muted. Okay. Thanks to Sarah Withers, Christina Duriter, Greg Soa for providing tech support and the University of New Hampshire for the invitation to speak to you all today. I'd like to start off by introducing myself. Um, my name is Michael Menchaca, as you may all know by now. Let me go ahead and share this screen. And so I'd like to include this a graphic that has um, verified artists under it. And some of you may recognize where this graphic came from. For those of you who are not familiar, it comes from an online profile of a recording artist on the music streaming platform, Spotify. And I'd like to start off by emphasizing that no living artist should ever seek verification from any commercial platform, nonprofit organization, or any other kind of public institution. In our current economy, artists today, whether visual artists, recording artists, or performing artists, we can easily fall into the trap set up by corporate machines that have a seeking commercial verification or other forms of validation to serve that serve to promote the interests of the commercial platforms and pit artists against one another in a divide and conquer strategy. So our strength in our our strength is in creative autonomy and self determination which does not necessitate verification from any one thing or person. So I'll expand on that a little bit more and how in our current economy, artists can advocate for themselves and for their self-determination in the art market. So with that, um, I'll talk a little bit about my background in growing up playing video games um, during the Cold War era, during um, the the so-called war on drugs era in the 80s and 90s there were a lot of these uh games where they're they were featuring white antagonists or right protagonists um facing racialized threats racialized bodies darker skinned folks um that that were seen as threats throwing uh knives and throwing different kinds of obstacles at the the main hero which is usually like a blonde buff guy and along with that are these subliminal messages like introducing the gameplay um promoting the war on on drugs and and of course like that that has uh, racial uh undertones but i absorbed that kind of uh subliminal propaganda uh while being engaged in like a form of uh electronic escapism and and that had uh, uh, significant effects uh, going down uh, into adulthood that I didn't realize until I became a little bit more conscious about this upbringing and started to question my my role in in this and and it's just a, a absurd uh, colonial uh, imagery that's embedded in this form of entertainment and in contemporary times we have a similar thing going on with with our apps and and so I'll talk a little bit about that later also but. Uh, just to give you an indication that these kinds of uh, images and games perpetuated uh, like vigilante justice and uh, uh, we're uplifting uh, institutions like the police um, in the in the states and so growing up in in the northeast side of san antonio texas uh, i i um yeah, I always felt that there was this kind of hierarchy established by um, white supremacy. And since the European invasion of the Americas, this particular region, um, the land of Yanawana, as it was originally uh, called, uh, has has been in under six different flags, as shown in this slide. And we know locally that San Antonio is a community with deep colonial roots in military and civil policing practices, commonly promoting anti-black, anti-brown, anti-native, anti-trans narratives, where disinformation campaigns of racialized crime waves are still pervasive and remain profitable. And imperialist narratives flourish, celebrating colonial fantasies against 
Mexican heritage and ancestry. And San Antonio is home to an ongoing psychological terror campaign known as Fiesta, which is promoting cultural arrogance that fur further naturalizes hierarchies of social power that have been constructed over centuries to privilege those with European genealogy. So I, I grew up sensing that kind of hierarchy. And so I, I took an interest early on in my art uh, practice to try to visualize this hierarchy and finding these kinds of graphics where um, the, the racial hierarchy was explicitly labeled or an attempt to explicitly label that hierarchy um, was one way to, to think about that kind of um, those those feelings that I had of, of just feeling like powerless and and angry and, and not really understanding why and so like many Texans um, I consider myself media mediating the internalized racist and colorist beliefs embedded in me by the legacy of white supremacy in the Americas and the common response locally here to that legacy is to react with giddy complacency as illustrated on the right um, Natalia Molina, a scholar, um, refers to as this feeling as benevolent assimilation, meaning to remain silent and maintain the status quo. And I should also mention that there is a, a corollary response by BIPOC in this region committed to acts of shared resistance and struggle. And growing up in, in a, like a highly policed community like San Antonio, it's it's really a miracle, uh, and I agree with uh, Maryam Kaba when she says this also in her book, um, We Do This Till We Free Us, that for, for those who grew up in, in highly policed uh, communities, um, for, for people to grow any consciousness of this structure um, is, is really a miracle because it's so hard to, to counteract the, the structure that, that promotes uh, institutions like the police and the military. And so it wasn't until I went to college um, to get my undergraduate degree at Texas State in San Marcos that I started to feel this cultural alienation from my Mexican heritage and my assimilation into the dominant narrative of colorblind racism. And it was through Arizona SB 1070, the strict anti-immigration measure that made um, policing uh, brown bodies in space as the law of the land. So around this time, I was also um, engaged in a practice of illustrating um, what kind of like a diary, like a personal diary, um, make an illustration a day. And that was that went parallel with other art projects that that I was exposed to at that time. There were different blogs. This was before Instagram, of course, and before social media. Um, blogs were really a way to um, to promote one's work or one, one's illustration or, or biography in, in a sense. So I engage in this kind of drawing practice every day, try to satisfy uh, producing an image that I could share publicly. And so that really helped me establish kind of a, a style. And I got to the point where I felt like I could illustrate pretty much anything, but I wanted to illustrate not just things that would help sell products as I was being taught and trained in my courses as a graphic designer. Um, I wanted to speak to my cultural ancestry and and have something that would possibly live on beyond me and, and express the, the perspective of a South Texan. So I sort of, I, I created this avatar for my experience as a South Texan with Mexican ancestry. And I was studying cartoonists of the mid-century cartoon masters of um, like Warner Brothers or Hanna-Barbera cartoons. But I wanted to have also a cultural component, one that spoke to my um, South Texas experience. So this character helped me bring uh, a discussion about race and um, yeah, and privilege in, in a sense to my art class through in the critique process. So it was kind of a way to to make it fun or at least engaging, like lure people into a discussion about race. And so this is how I was printing them um, using a large one arm uh, press uh, squeegee. And and so it's a lot of labor to make these images that look fun and, and they're very graphic and draw people's attention with the colors. 
Um, and part of that was studying these other printmakers who were producing similar kinds of images, but there wasn't that cultural component. There wasn't that identity reflected. If anything, it was more like a, a, like a more fun, carefree image. But I wanted to sort of hijack that kind of presentation to think about more concerning um, social issues. And so this is another image by the Little Friends of Printmaking who um, really inspired me as I was an undergrad learning this craft of screen printing and, and working with illustration as, as a drawing practice. Um, but it gives you a sense of the, the kind of print studio um, and how, how it looks like in, when it's flourishing in, in the process of making an image. So this is a, when I first started contextualizing that avatar in, in, this, in a scene or a landscape that repeated the, the kind of uh, simultaneous um, kind of narrative uh, presentation of the ancient codices uh, from the, the mid uh, or the 15th century. And so this was a generative model for me to express my racial awakening in pictographic terms, connecting my practice of precision digital drawing with ancient American expression. Since 2010, um, I produced thousands of these vector-based digital drawings, and some of those have been translated into screen prints. Others have made their way into paintings, digital prints, digital animations, and recently new media installation environments that recall the hyperbolic gridded pictures of the ancient Mexican codices. And also incorporated into my digital codex are these cultural influences from my upbringing growing up in the 80s and 90s that I mentioned earlier, video games uh, that depict racialized threats to US settler colonial power, um, the hyper patriotism in video games that were marketed to young male gamers, um, promoting the war on drugs and the US role in the Vietnam War, World War II and the Cold War. Um, again, these images were filled with violent imagery, sexually suggestive themes, and colonial fantasies. So if, if I was to address these concerns in that kind of pictographic way, uh, I learned that I had to develop my own vocabulary and that, that uh, necessitated um, the development of my own pattern library. So I've considered this my digital codex. and. So going on, fast forwarding to RISD, uh, I picked up animation um, through the, the digital media courses there and the film and video department. So that uh, allowed me to replicate the graphic quality of the arcade games that influenced me growing up. And so I, I was able to create this mix of ancient American expression, as I mentioned, through the codex kind of framework that, that kind of um, organizing of space as a simultaneous space and also the the kind of like slot machine um, presentation that that asks people to engage and um, usually that's used for promoting um, a consumer culture so that allowed me to create this kind of juxtaposition that speaks the language of consumer and capitalist culture um, but it's turn on its head because it's criticizing those various very systems speaking the same language um so what i like to do with my installations is to create an environment that is um integrating both digital prints and screen prints like traditional print environments so in this case this is a installation at the McNay museum in san antonio and i covered the Every square foot of this uh, gallery that was given to me for this exhibition, which I treated like a kind of like a like a greatest hits of my print practice at that time. This was 2018, and I mixed the the presentation of wrapping the entire gallery in a print, so that people can come in to this space and they became a part of a screen print in a sense. Their bodies were placed within this print environment and that replicated the the figures or the relationship of the figures in my prints and the space that's usually covered in patterns um, that's depicted behind these characters 
And this is an image of my undergraduate thesis um, exhibition. So early on, I wanted a gridded kind of codex layout for my printmaking practice. And at the Smithsonian Museum of American Art, um, this show just came out um, or just came down earlier this year. Um, but you can see how there's this closeness to how I presented my undergraduate thesis and how I decided to present my work today is, is to combine a digital sensibility in the presentation, whether through projection mapping um, or digital wallpaper. I'd like to combine those like traditional uh, mediums that Chicanos in the past have used during previous social justice movements. But I, I'd like to indicate that the needle is moving towards accepting uh, digital world building practices and even in the in the in the case of a printmaking exhibition. So that I feel is what my um, where I fall in is within the the general art market, but specifically within the the Latinx art market. And so you may be familiar with these works being that I think this is up on display at the museum in, in New Hampshire University. Um, but these prints were a collaborative print process working with Julia Samuels, the master printer at Overpass Projects based in Providence, Rhode Island. Julia invited me to uh, create a series of prints with them to um, to promote both the, the press and also to promote the work that, that I had been doing previously to, to our collaboration. And, and so these really helped me to um, push forward the color mixing, the technical process of the printmaking. Uh, initially, I did not mix colors. So technically, these are like an evolution of what I've been doing in my print design, but also they start to get more dense, um, densely packed imagery that um, reflects the animation process. So at this point, I'm combining animated kind of um, uh, graphics and freeze, freezing them and translating them into a screen printing traditional practice. So that makes these um, particularly interesting. And along with that was trying to catalog contemporary events and add to the roster of figures that I had already built in my digital codex. Uh, and so that that involved um, adding more contemporary and more specific caricatures or characters of, of political figures that, that were um, using um, our technical and, and electronic instruments to push certain uh, agendas into the, the public sphere. So um, yeah, trying to maintain uh, that digital vernacular um, that speaks the arcade kind of graphic language, but obviously uh, the content is, is very tied to the current events and the Twitter sphere and the tech washing solutions that, that political um, and corporate leaders tend to push. And so around 2018, I started to think outside of the Latinx community and start to think about how the struggle of Latinx folks um, mirrors the African-American experience. And this idea of emancipatory internationalism that Paul Ortiz, a historian, has, has pushed um, really helped to uh, motivate me to uh, not only chronicle or document um, the concerns of the black community, but to to see them as uh, as my uh, responsibility also to address in my prints. So I started to depict the the African American experience through these this avatar of an African elephant, and codifying race this way, of course, evokes like maybe a child like a childishness or like a, like a elementary, um, you know, uh, understanding of, of, of difficult subject matter. But I think that that allows also for multiple interpretations to, to be had. And so in short, this, through this um, kind of awakening, 
uh, of, of my practice, I was also trying to use a different means of making prints using digital um, or like laser cutters in, in this case to make a woodblock print that would incorporate a, more like a rough um, kind of uh, texture that isn't there in my screen prints. So um, whenever I get this opportunity to work with the press, uh, I try to utilize um, new kinds of print um, practices that I haven't done already. So, And so I, I continued making these kinds of prints, um, working with um, the imagery and, and, and getting inspired from articles um, on, on these issues as they developed. But trying to, to keep my focus on the, the South Texas kind of representation, because a lot of the times when you do have Latinx representation, it comes from like a West Coast perspective or, or recently like an East Coast perspective or, or Chicago, but you don't see things from like San Antonio specifically. So I try to think about the my upbringing, what I have to bring with my perspective and and again, the colonial roots tied to um, policing and and what I can bring through this video game kind of um, presentation. So this is a digital print um, printed locally here in San Antonio. So the the advent of printing digital files from like a digital drawing tablet or um, a digital illustrator file means I don't have to break down the colors and I'm, I'm free to use gradients and things that, that would be more difficult to print in a traditional print practice. Um, you know, I can let loose with the digital print. So that's been a, um, a huge uh, step moving forward with recent work is to accept that I don't have to physically print things or, or go through that struggle uh, it's okay to also incorporate a digital print practice. Like there's early on, like in printmaking as a student, um, we are socialized to think of of digital prints as like lesser art forms for some reason. And, and I think that, that that's going away, um, but that's something um, interesting that I'd like to, to, to raise. And recently with the, the, the most um, current research that I've been doing is on our relationship to our technology and how this thing that uh, Shoshana Zuboff has coined as surveillance capitalism, how that is perpetuating the, the, the white supremacist ideology that um, you know capitalism is one and the same with what Cedric Robinson calls racial capitalism and how the internet is basically uh, run by five different companies, private companies that um, accumulate as much data as they can on their users and um, convince the masses that there's, there's no alternative, that we have to accept the terms that they, that they claim are, are valid to keep the services running and free. Um, but that also brings the, these concerns about um, if one is to have a surveillance state um, like like China does, um, if if a democracy or if a country that identifies as a democracy maintains these um, this kind of uh, like constant surveilling uh, for the sake of um, securing the homeland, as it's said. Uh, then we don't really have freedom in the sense that um, our founders claimed it to be. And so there's, there's a lot of concerns there that, that are worth uh, raising to, to our uh, government officials. But revisiting the whole pyramid of, of the hierarchy of power, um, I, I sometimes search and find interesting correlations between different pyramids and, and the hierarchies. and. So uh, this is like another iteration that is informing the work is the, the Indian caste system on the right uh, versus like what someone created on the internet on the left is like the AirPod owners are the elite and Android users are the, the so-called untouchables. And so that kind of hierarchy um, informs the, the recent work that I've been doing in, 
in this case, what we have is um, a society that is always suspicious of those who have historically been uh, been marginalized or deemed threats. And so we have like a digital version of this moment is if you are not on Instagram, if you're not on these platforms, then uh, you are uh, you are trying to hide something. And that's just an illegitimate assumption that that one is supposed to constantly be uh, sending a stream of data uh, on your location and geotags and all that for the sake of safety. And that's just a ridiculous notion that that I raise in my work. And then these companies have um, de de developed their own facial recognition systems that identify white faces at almost 100% accuracy, as we saw with the case with the, the rioters, uh, the Capitol rioters last year, or earlier in this year, actually. And then for um, highly melanated folks, brown skin folks, um, it's the percentage is not 100 percent. There's misidentification is common and um, people of color tend to be criminalized um, when when it's not the case that they were ever involved in a crime or, or anything like that. So being wrongfully accused by algorithms is a new uh, civil rights concern. And so I bring that also to the, the recent work that I've been doing. And so then we also have these um, initiatives and local companies that are partnering with um, the police agencies to try to increase the tech, uh, the high tech um, nature of policing. And so what we have is basically this, uh, or the potential for robo, like robo cops, robo dogs to um, it just target the, the, the wrong kind of, um, or, or the, the rate for error, or at least like the window for error is, is dangerously high for these kinds of robots to be actually uh, used by these institutions. So I characterize this as um, a new kind of uh, era in the colorism, racism, colonial hierarchy that has been established in the Americas. And Ruha Benjamin characterizes this as the new Jim Code. The definition here being that the employment of new technologies reflect and reproduce existing inequities, but they're promoted and perceived as more objective and progressive than previous discriminatory systems. So with that, I'll end towards uh, La Raza Cosmica 20XX is a series of prints that have been printed by Overpass Projects. And this is my attempt to uh, raise those concerns of, of a caste system um, that mimics the, the Spanish caste system of colonial Mexico and how the, our new technologies are working to further marginalize and target um, people of color, both as consumers, but also target them as people to be served to to be controlled or, or manipulated um, towards certain specific actions. They may be political actions or consumer actions. So in this economy that we currently have, we have um, these five companies, uh, Amazon, Apple, Google, Facebook, Microsoft, that are just ubiquitous if in any social uh, sense, like if we're to engage with our friends and family, we have no other alternative but to use these five companies' platforms that they've made so accessible because it benefits them to uh, continually monitor the behavior of the users. And so this is a dangerous situation that we find ourselves in. And so I'm, I'm raising that concern in these kinds of fun kind of presentation, but Ultimately, this is um, is me trying to reinvent that um, the social hierarchy that the casta um, tradition in colonial Mexico um, visualized or, or presented in a gridded format. I also characterize our current conditions as a cage without borders, as this uh, installation recently featured at the the Triennial in El Museo del Barrio in New York City. And so um, working with 
looking at the, the codices again, like looking at them even closer and trying to uh, visually pair the icons of contemporary um, smartphone technology and internet companies, um, the graphics that we all understand, the three dots that indicate there's more options, the, um, the red, yellow, and green circles that we push to minimize or expand windows on our computer screens or X's and minuses. Those are very much codified um, symbols that we uh, internalize and we, we don't second guess, we understand them because they require that kind of digital literacy is required for us to just operate in, in any formal capacity um, today. So I, I want to connect those dots uh, on how this vocabulary is tied very closely to a way of documenting um, narratives and myths um, throughout the Americas. And so th this is like a, a trip, you, you get to see how um, I separated that installation as a triptych and that of course evokes um, altarpiece triptychs of the colonial era. Um, if you're not familiar with altarpieces in, in Catholicism, it's a devotional practice that artists produce um, images in three um, that, that evoke the, the, you know, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so I have a similar kind of presentation with this, but presenting the or contemporary emperors or, or conquistadores like Bezos and Zuckerberg um, as, as our contemporary uh, conquistadores. And so one, one other thing is keeping up with the, the language, um, at least the visual language of how we receive important information. And so thinking about how soft edges are a thing, like that's, the, that's just, a con they indicate like a contemporary um, information. So, so I've become uh, aware, you know, soften your edges. Um, drop, do like small drop shadows, things like that are hugely informative to me because they, they indicate how the public is receiving information and what I can do to publicly present information uh, and to subvert these kinds of like, um, you know, presentations or, or in some cases fear mongering. Uh, I have this online project. Um, visit this website if you'd like to see this. Um, it was also tied to the, the Triennial in uh, El Museo. And then, um, yeah, so I think I'll maybe, let me skip forward. Okay, so this is like the, where I'm at right now is continuing to produce more imagery. Um, Zuckerberg has, you know, they have rebranded uh, as, as Meta. And so of course, that's, this is a, an escape hatch as the New York Times has characterized it as for Zuckerberg to to try to escape the negative branding that Facebook has accumulated over the last decade. And that doesn't mean that the problems are going away. It just means it's a different kind of aesthetic. So I, I'm trying to continue to, to characterize this, this conquest that's happening as a dangerous um, situation that, that needs to be regulated by the government if we are to indeed have a democracy. So uh, let me go ahead and switch modes to play this video. And I think I clicked on sound to share. So hopefully the, the sound plays. So let's try it out. That is tech savvy capitalists with religious teachings of an interconnected digital utopia erected a global computer network called the Internet using standard communication protocol. SCP, or Transmission Control Protocols, TCP, to interconnect computers across the globe via server-client relationships. Soon after, anthropoid capitalists construct a digital online spirit world that would bring them the capacity to extract an infinite amount of lucrative material data from descendants of black and indigenous people of color. This online world provided white supremacists the opportunity to fashion their own gods in their own image, preach the virtues of online individuality, and create a new kind of attention economy that commodified and exploited black and indigenous ancestral wisdom, their need for community, curiosity, and self-reflection. 
Soon after, big tech data scientists give birth to the algorithm, that is artificial intelligence, AI, or machine learning, to assist in automating all living behavior in the new world on new digital tools connected to the internet within a digitally controlled environment. Techno-utopians refer to these digital tools as the Internet of Think Devices, or IoT devices that bless us with their constant connectivity online. IoT devices enable the following social norms within the new world. The institution of news feeds, that is machine-curated mobile notifications, via the algorithm, assisted by Anthropo data scientists, which enable citizens to constantly monitor their mobile computers at all times, even while operating an automobile. Okay, so um, the last thing I'll say is hope is a discipline. The, that quote comes from Marianne Kaba's book, We Do This Till We Free Us, Abolitionist Organizing and Transforming Justice. And when I initially proposed this mural for uh, University of New Hampshire, um, you can see on the right, it's a very um, DIY uh, way of envisioning that mural in the public space that was um, being proposed. Um, but I'm, I'm very happy with how I've seen it documented, um, both through like a video that was shared with me and also this image on the left, because I think it really does pull the viewer's attention towards this quote, um, which I wanted to f feature centrally on, on this elevator, um, on the, the exterior of the, the Paul Creative Arts Center. Um, I, I really wish I could see this in person to experience and feel um, the visual weight that, that it may occupy in the space or as one is driving or walking by. Um, but my hope is that it brings students, faculty, and visitors to the university uh, to, to contemplate on what the discipline of hope may entail in their own personal lives. Um, a lot of us are struggling right now. It's a pandemic. And I think in terms of, of a quote, there couldn't be a more um, uh, positive message that, that I could try to bring to public spaces other than Ms. Kaba's uh, quote. Um, because it's very easy to be pessimistic in this kind of environment and during a pandemic, but for us to, to try to try to survive, you know, one is to, has to have that discipline of re remaining hopeful and, and and doing things for each other and and raising each other up and, and not seeing one another as competitors but as partners and and so I, I'd like to end with that um, um, you know to to remind us of, of that quote so thank you all for your attention and I'll leave it open to Q&A Thanks so much, Michael. I really wish that you were able to see the mural in person and uh, it would have been nice to be able to host you live in person. Um, but this has been a fantastic presentation. Thanks so much. Um, I wanna begin with a, a question that I have. As you've moved from printing on paper to printing digitally, um, and with the rise of NFTs, how are you going to navigate that drive towards what you've described as surveillance capitalism um, when it's, I think, would be very easy for you to engage in that economy? Yeah, I've recently gotten that question, actually. Um, I think there's this assumption that because <clears throat> NFTs are marketed as like a democratic um, opportunity to make money for for those who have have been relegated to like a digital sphere now there's a market to make money off of digital art <clears throat> I don't see it as um I see it as a gimmick in short and apologies my, my throat I kind of have a, a tickle <coughs> but um I'll try, I'll try my best not to choke on this answer <laughs> <clears throat> But um, I, I'm skeptical yeah, um, of, of that. Um, I'm seeing, I'm waiting it out and, and seeing how artists um, use use NFTs. I, I know Kevin Roos from the New York Times has, uh, he turned one of his columns into an NFT and 
raised a lot of money for um, an organization <coughs> when he could have, you know, benefited and just made some money there. But um, yeah, so I, I'm seeing how that takes takes off. Um, but I'm skeptical because early adopters of NFTs and early promoters include Paris Hilton. Um, and so I don't want to be associated with those kinds of promoters <laughs> because I don't, mm -hmm. I don't agree with those positions. So yeah, I think it's, um, it's a work in progress. Um, I'll continue making traditional, um, objects that, that are sold and collected before I jump on any, um, digital bandwagon like that. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, uh, just so I'll give, I'll give, I'll answer a question that somebody put in the Q and A, just to give you a chance if you want to get get a drink or something. But somebody asked how the mural was applied to the exterior wall at UNH, and it's a vinyl graphic application that is removable, so it doesn't use um, a glue. It's not an adhesive in that way, and it is removable because the panels of the elevator tower, I think, are coated aluminum, so it's quite smooth and it should be able to peel off. Um, and certainly we designed it that way so that if the weather or if the light affected or if the mural itself were damaged, we would be able to replace it. So I hope that answers your question. Um, Michael, here's a question for you. Are you involved with any advocacy groups that are either regional or national that allow you to express your concerns around social justice? I am a member of Mi Gente, um, so that is um, one of the few um, social justice advocate um, orgs that, that I participate in and am informed by. Um, but beyond that, I haven't, um, you know, I, I, and I should also add that I recently started identifying as an activist myself um, because it came to my attention after doing a few public lectures and, and receiving feedback um, in the Q&A and, and during interviews also that um, me raising social uh, concerns in, in an art practice is is my kind of the way that I've chosen to be an activist is to is to kind of subvert or, or take over um, art spaces to open a dialogue that that's difficult to have without the, the facilitation of a visual like aids. So I consider my my prints, especially um, and, and animations also to be visual aids that that help promote my concerns, definitely. Mm -hmm. And, um, <clears throat> and I've tried to take a more active position by recently reaching out to those to me in particular, which is a Latinx oriented um, organization but um yeah nothing beyond that at the moment okay well and there's such a rich tradition too of of, of latino latinx graphics posters and and social movements and communicating through graphic arts so you're certainly in great company did the um smithsonian exhibition produce a catalog for people that are interested Yes, they did. They printed a very beautiful catalog. Um, tie it. It's called Printing the Revolution. And it, it includes um, beautiful illustrations of the, the prints that were on display. I wasn't able to see that exhibition in, per, in person, unfortunately, but um, the, the catalog is, is a great substitute for those who couldn't make it. So I would encourage people that are on this call who want to see sort of that history that um, Michael is a part of to check out that catalog. Um, your prints, have you ever, print, this is a question that was posed, have you printed um, the codices as separate works of art in their traditional book form or have you always kept them in, in framed pieces, as framed pieces? I mean, I haven't always framed the pieces. Um, I didn't always have that budget. Um, to be honest, when I first started making prints, I felt like they had to be framed, um, especially when I was an undergrad for that thesis show. It was like a way of paying respect to the work and showing folks that I really value the, the print practice and I wanted them to be seen as like precious objects because I was like a graphic design escapee that I was trying to f find a, a footing in the fine art kind of realm or that kind of market. <clears throat> 
but I've also presented them um, under plexiglass um, shelves that have been situated along gallery walls okay. to try to indicate like you're supposed to read these images as in a sequence to further connect it to like a codex manuscript, but I haven't yet published or, or organize them in a book format. Um, that's something I'm definitely interested in because of the original source was an accordion folded codex. Mm -hmm. So I, I think I'm working towards that in, in a future project, but um, haven't done that yet. Okay. Here's another um, question for you from the Q&A. Your pieces successfully use a variety of line color repetition. How do you find balance and do you ever find it challenging to implement your designs cohesively? <clears throat> yes, I always find it challenging to implement them cohesively. And that's why when I'm designing my work, um, I have several versions of the same composition open. And so I'm able to freely play around with dragging elements in, dragging them out. And then recently, like with the overpass prints, I was making animations of the same composition. So if you can imagine like this, this mural image behind me in an animated format, that would uh, give me more ideas on, on what the freeze frame version of it would be. And that may have like some like electrical things going on or, or you know, animations that aren't present when I'm initially like dragging around, you know, faces and stuff, but when they're in motion, um, there's more juxt interesting juxtapositions that happen. So sometimes animating at the same time helps um, with those decisions, but okay. it's always a challenge. Yeah. And I, so I have um, another question. I just have to be aware of the time. It's two o'clock and so people may start to drop off, but before um, you, know, you go, I know that you came to RISD for your MFA in printmaking and you wanted to bring in some of your experiences in San Antonio and that imagery. Um, what was that perspective? And could you talk about the reception of your work in New England with your faculty and peers? Yeah, I got a lot of support, um, which was new because um, not that I wasn't supported by my faculty as an undergrad at Texas State, but in terms of the public reception of the work, um, there was more of this entertainment aspect that I hadn't been exposed to it, about my my work. So I felt like there was um, both the opportunity to entertain the viewer uh, and educate on on like regional specific concerns of South Texas. Um, but also with that, um, it made me aware to not only entertain, but but to um, you know, have have a critical uh, perspective that is that tries to be first before it entertains. Um, but yeah, I, I think animation really helped drive the work into more of a of like an interactive experience with the viewer. And that wasn't yet the case when I had just done the work as an undergrad at Texas State. So printmaking was my way to like get into uh, get my foot into the door for RISD. And then I kind of abandoned printmaking while I was in the program. Um, okay. I just, I took on a, a digital um, workflow. Okay. Um, just while we have you, another question came in. Um, in the Migrant Grand Caravan, what did the red and white striped flag stand for? And the student says that in their class, they learned about the different dangers that migrants faced while trying to flee the U.S. as well as secret seeking, oh, wait, as well as the different forms of violence that migrants experience. Um, did the sections of the Migrant Grand Caravan stand for these systemic struggles, dangers, and inequality? Yeah, that's a great question, and I I invite the 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 questioner, the audience member to, to think about answering that for themselves um, before I, I offer um, my um, intention there. But I will, I will say that those stripes um, were a way to, to recall the flags um, of the countries that, that those folks were representing and, and they're identifying themselves like through a national affiliation that, 
that you know this is a shared struggle that has colonial ties to the the european invasion of the americas and um yeah i wanted to indicate that visually but i didn't want to specifically tie it to any national affiliation so um i think the stripes really uh, afforded me that 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 ability to to indicate like nationality but mm -hmm. without but without being too um specific about that yeah you could use the language of flags of flag construction to reference nationalism without specific specifying a country yeah and in um, the codices there are those those similar flags um or things that look like flags. Um, for example, in Codex Mendoza, there's um, there's there's a section with where it's just like it looks like flags, and so I, I jump with those kinds of um, intuitive readings of the originals, and then uh, find meaning in them today. Terrific. And so my last question: um, You mention online on your website that um, you noticed. Uh, years ago, sort of the negative effect of existing in a digital economy on your family, the amount of screen time, their use of mobile devices. Um, and as you moved into digital realms yourself, clearly spending a lot of time constructing your videos and creating your digital prints. Um, you know, just talk about like how you find respite or how you how you unplug um, knowing the harm that spending so much time online can do, or are you not immune to the seductive powers of <laughs> <laughs> digital media yourself? I'm not immune, just like anyone else. Like it's a very um, uh, craft. They're very crafty, you know. Marketers, they know what they're doing. They they have a lot of data that supports their tactics to engage folks, you know, and and the the. I think the uh, the only principle, if anyone can find one at Facebook is or Meta, is that if it enrages, it engages, and that's that goes throughout entire like Silicon Valley's history. And so I try really hard not to get engaged slash enraged by the tech um, because it doesn't help me at all to be pay to have my attention controlled by these companies. And so um, having taken myself off, deplatforming myself in, a, in another way of putting it uh, has afforded me the ability to have um, like a greater perspective on, on um, I guess, the, the economy since I entered um, the internet economy, like ever since I've been an adult, like I've been online, like most folks, um, or I guess Gen Z may have a different relationship to the internet, but um, yeah, I, I try to distance myself, uh, you know, delete all the apps. And I have this one page on my website where I, I list the reasons why and and try to share that that information with the public because um, it's uh, it's it's impossible to not engage in these things. But the only solution I can come up with for the time being until regulation happens, and I hope that it will, is to to minimize your use, uh, and I call it vi uh, digital veganism, is to turn to digital veganism, give yourself a, a, a diet on how much screen time is needed for your day. And and I started seeing like, uh, you know, my nervous system um, uh, thanked me for it. I was no longer felt, I no longer felt debilitated by um, constant information, um, and in a lot of cases, useless information being t thrown at me. So, well, yeah. that is, yeah, that's kind of a, an important reminder for people. I know people have to go, so I want to thank them for their time, and I hope that people will take your recommendation and put themselves on a digital vegan diet, <laughs> <laughs> more aware, <laughs> more aware of their usage for their own for their own well being. Um, it's been absolutely a pleasure, and I really hope that once the pandemic is, the dangers have passed, that you'll be able to come up and see the mural in person. Um, we're thrilled to be able to have it on our campus, and it's been an absolute pleasure to speak with you today. So it's always great to see you. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much, much for the invitation. Appreciate it. Take care. Bye-bye. 
Bye.